And in this series, we just kind of wanted to do some character studies on some amazing women of God and men of God. And May it was women of God and legends that have walked by faith and done some amazing things. And now we're in June looking at the men of God. And I really hope that that this inspires you. I really do. Men that are here today, this inspires you to be the man that God has called you to be, man, and rise up. And hey, you're already you're already doing something really well by bringing your family to church or at least letting them drag you to church today. Whatever it was, you're doing good. All right, guy, you're doing you're doing good. Let me show you the theme verse here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one in this series. If you've missed any of it, you can catch them online. But the idea of this series is that these legends that have gone before us, the Bible talks about them in Hebrews chapter 11. A lot of people, um, it's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. You know, it's kind of what it's, it's called. And just character after character, this is who they were, this is what they did. It's just a really cool chapter. Hebrews 12 follows that up and it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by all these legends, he says this great cloud of witnesses, uh, they're watching us, they're witnessing our life. Uh, he says that they can actually celebrate us hey, because of that. Let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with perseverance. And this word is key, the race marked out for us in the Bible. There's a few different places that kind of likens our life to a race that has a beginning and an end in this journey um, that takes perseverance and endurance. Now, it, it's, you can't really, yeah, they can see us, these legends of faith can see us, but you can't really engage in a conversation with them, you can't have dialogue. But in this series, we're asking the question, what would it be like if we could, if we could just have them come down one at a time and run a lap with us on our, on our race here? And, and what would they say based on their life? What would they say to us? We had a lot of, four women in May and four guys in, uh, in June here, where this is the second to the last guy we're going to be studying. So today we're going to pull down from the great grandstand of heaven. He's going to run a lap with us, and it's the prophet Jonah. Jonah, the prophet, is going to run a lap with us. And Jonah's an interesting Bible character because he is known most for his mess ups, you know, and his mistakes. And, and so, how I many you know those are like, those are some good teachers that, be, that people have gone before us and made mistakes? I'm the second youngest of seven siblings. So I learned a lot what not to do, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I, even don't raise your hand because, you know, I don't want to offend any parents that are, but how many had parents, you know what I mean? You're like, okay, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. And some of you fathers, by the way, just, you know, the same Father's Day message, but some of you fathers, you need to blaze a new trail for your family and not the one, not, not the example that was set before you quite possibly. But sometimes failure and the failures of others are great teachers. And so Jonah, what I believe he would say is, when you've made some bad choices, if he can come down and talk to us, he'd, I think he would encourage and say, hey, when you've made some bad diso- choices, because I've made some, how I many you know we've made some bad choices? Anyone here ever made a bad choice, right? Bought something impulsively off the you know, TV infomercial, anything like that? <laughs> come on, I know every one of us, this is relevant to every single one of us. We've, ha- we've made some, some bad choices. I was doing it just for funsies, Googled, you know, bad choices and stuff, and I kind of have some pictures of some different bad choices. You guys check these out here. This first one is of this car. I mean, that's a bad choice right there. Come on, bro. What were you thinking? Get the truck. It's thirty nine ninety five. Okay. That's a bad choice. How about this next one here? This AC repair guy. I'll do it myself, he says. Yeah. Okay. Bad choice. Here's another one. Another AC. I think this one's from Russia. This next one, these Russian guys dangling their buddy. He owed him money. You know, he's like, so where is it at now? You know, so... That's just a bad choice. And then this other one here, it's, it, was, it went around a little bit on, on, on social media. You can charge your phone in the microwave. That's a bad choice, right? It's just a bad, some people did it. It's just, I'm sure they regret it. Speaking about regrets with this next one, classic, classic. No regrets, no regrets. Yeah, she's regretting that choice, huh? So we've all made it though. We've all made some bad choices. So Jonah would come along and say, hey, when you made some bad choices, you just need to know, man, that we serve the God of second chances. We serve the God of second chances, that there is, you cannot go far enough. You cannot disobey long enough. You cannot do bad enough that God will never want you back, man. He will pursue you down with his reckless love. Amen, church? Jonah is, is a good parallel, I believe, though, for manhood today. Because um, I think there's a lot of men that, are, that, have, that have kind of gone the wrong direction, turning their back on the will of God, the pers- purpose of God, and following something entirely, entirely selfish and entirely on their own. Um, look at the story here in Jonah chapter 1, picking up at the very first verse. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. 
But Jonah, look at this, he ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. Now, um, it, it, Nineveh was the capital of Syria in biblical times, which is in like northern Iraq. Um, and Tarshish was like in Spain, so opposite direction. So God literally told, told um, Jonah to go northeast and Jonah heads southwest. He goes in the, in the exact opposite, like as far away as I can get from the will of God. And I don't blame Jonah too much here because, because the, the, the people that he was calling him to go to to preach, you know, a strong message, but a message of repentance. And Jonah didn't want them to receive that because they were, the, the place of Nineveh was, was, there were some wicked people. They were terrorists in their own right of that day. They destroyed people, killed a lot. They would go and ransack cities and take slaves and captives. They did it to Israel. And so Jonah didn't want none of that. He didn't want these evil people get an offer of, of repentance. So Jonah uh, runs away and he heads for Tarshish. It says he went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. Then there on, the, on this ship, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo. So now they're throwing stuff over sea to lighten the ship. Do you realize that every decision you make costs something? Every decision, it costs you something. And, and every wrong decision you make costs the people closest to you something as well. Jonah made a bad decision and drug these sailors into this storm that he himself created. It says, Jonah, though he gone below deck where he lay down and fell asleep. Isn't it interesting? Like some people are so unconscious of the impact of their bad decisions, that the impact it has on the people around them. And every wrong decision we make, it costs the people around us. Every decision we make, though, carries impact. It carries impact. And every decision we make in some way is making us. We make the decision, and in some way that decision is forming our character. It's, it's shaping our destiny. In some way, it's, it's reshaping us, the decisions that we're making. So I guess the overarching question today is, is are, are the decisions that you're making drawing you closer to a relationship with God? Or are the decisions you're making driving you further away from the will of God? Are those decisions you're making, you know, about your, your, your job, your career? How about that promotion, that decision that weighs in the balance, that, that financial decision, that promotion? Maybe it's a relationship decision. Is that decision going to draw me closer to God or is it going to drive me further away from him? So the storm comes and, and it's beating the ship up and they're throwing stuff overboard. And Jonah eventually wakes up and he recovers from this bad decision. And I want you to know this. Listen, if you come in today to church and you're in the middle of a bad decision, Maybe you're seeing some of the effects of a bad decision. I want you to know, please listen, you serve the God. We serve the God of second chances. And you can recover no matter how far you've gone, done, gone, no matter what you've done or how bad it is. There is nothing that you cannot recover from because we serve the God of second chances. Amen. So if you want to recover from a bad choice, um, whether it's a future one or one that you're in today, you do what Jonah did. And he's a good example in this part here of how he recovers from the bad choice. Write it down. Take some notes from me, you guys. Number one, the first step has to be to take responsibility for your bad choice. It's got to be step one. Take responsibility for your bad choice. See, a lot of us, what we do in the middle of the storm is we look for someone to blame. We will make some excuses or we'll look. It's, uh, honestly, I was in a Bible study. It was a small group years ago. And, and we were talking about just different things. And, and one of the guys, he was sharing you know, said that, you know, because of just the outcome, what he's dealt with in life, he said, you know, because you know, my, my parents never read to me or anything. They didn't make me do my homework, so I never really liked school. So I can't, I can't really, I can't really, yeah, I'm not, I, I wasn't successful going back to school now. And, and I told him, are they still there stopping you from reading? Is that still happening? Because I can sympathize. I, I, I had a chaos, chaotic situation growing up, but it didn't stop me from falling in love with reading, getting my degree, at some point, you have to stop blaming the people around you for who you are today and where you are today and take some responsibility for that. Take responsibility for your bad choices. You see what happens is 
a lot, we try to make excuses. I mean, like, like this guy did. Or, or we, try, we say things like, well, it's not that bad. Or everybody else is. Or they are. Or, or it's not illegal. It's not necessarily wrong. And, and Jonah, Jonah could have said the same thing. It's not necessarily wrong for me to go to Tarshish. You know, I've always wanted to go on the Joppa cruise. You know what I mean? It's the Joppa cruise. I was just, that's all I was doing, was trying to take a cruise. But he know it violated his conscience of the direct will of God for his life. So instead of, instead of when you're deciding something, instead of thinking like, oh, what's permissible for me? You should be asking, what is wise? What is the will of God for me? Take responsibility for that choice. This is how Jonah did it. He tells him after he wakes up, these sailors, he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. He replied, it will be calm again. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. This storm happened. It's me. I mean, it's not, it's, it wasn't God. It wasn't my parents. It wasn't the economy. You know what? I messed up. I love Proverbs 28, 13. It says, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But he who confesses them, like you tell somebody, and he forsakes them, there's a change of direction there. There's a forsaking of, of that bad choice. It says this. I love it. He gets another chance. God is so ready, man, to give you another chance. Praise God we serve the God of another chance. Amen? Amen. Coach John Wooden says this. He said, I love this quote by him. You're not a failure until you start blaming others for your mistakes. So Jonah was picked up, thrown overboard at his request. Right. The sailor's like, "Okay, then, (laughs) you know, get out of here. You're the you, you know, you're the one who's bringing this. So Jonah and I love this about God. I love this about God. God knows where Jonah's at. God knows where his heart is. God knows the direction he's heading. He knows that he's, he's kind of even hurting the people around him. He's causing pain for the people around him. And God knows exactly where he is, and he knows how to get him exactly where he wants him to be. God is there. I love this. I love this about God. He is right there at the point of crisis, ready to rescue you every time. And here he is. He gets thrown overboard into an ocean. And the Bible says he gets swallowed up by a great fish. A great fish, and in which is it's a it's a miraculous story. It really is Jesus, and it's not a fable. Jesus corroborates this in the Gospels. He says, "Just as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the in the belly of the earth for three days and be resurrected." So it, this is so this was a miracle. God shut down the digestive system of this great huge fish that could swallow a man whole. He didn't eat anything again. He didn't pass anything. I mean, that's a frustrated fish right there. Come on. That's a frustrated fish just sitting there with that, you know. So he's there in, in the belly of, of this fish, and he's in a rough place. But I love God takes him from this chaos, from this storm, to, to this, this hectic place, to a place of isolation. Where, he was, where there was a storm and chaos and sailors throwing stuff all over the place, and to a place where he was all alone in quietness. It looked like, sure, it looked like this is another travesty, right? Now I'm in the belly of a ship, about to, or of a, of a fish, and I'm about to die. But that place of isolation can, be, can, can birth your greatest revelation, okay? There is a, if you, you want to recover and get back, you need to sometimes get away from the noise, get away from the chaos of life, and, the, and, the, and you need to get alone with God. I'm not talking about isolation and stay isolated i'm just saying separate yourself to hear from god because isolation is a place where you can get your greatest revelation from god and there in the middle of the belly in the middle of quietness and isolation he does number two repents and turns away from the bad choice he made he repents now that that that's a i know maybe a religious word to some of you but it really is not it doesn't it doesn't mean what maybe you sense it means it's a very beautiful um, awesome, powerful word. Repentance begins in your heart. Jonah 2 9, he says, What I vowed, he's telling God, What I vowed, I will make good. I know I've messed up, God. I know I went the wrong direction. I know I've disobeyed. But as soon as I'm out of here, I'm going to make good on that. I'm going to start following your will. I'm going to run after you, God. You cannot recover from those bad choices without repentance. Yeah, you can take responsibility, you can own up. But unless you repent, here's a good definition of repentance. Not in your notes, up here on the screen. Repentance means 
that you change your mind so deeply that it changes you. You change your mind so deeply that it changes you. It changes even your actions and your direction. So repentance is just not a cry that says, God, forgive me for the mistakes I made, for the mess I've made. The proof of repentance is where, where your feet are headed afterwards. What direction are you going after that cry of your heart? Are you, are, do you turn towards from away from Tarshish towards Nineveh? Are you turning away from your will to God's will? That's the proof of repentance. I love what Acts 3.19 says. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Here's the so that, right? This is, this is what the benefit is. Your sins get wiped away and here's the proof of repentance. Times of refreshing from the Lord will come again. That's, that's the root, man. That just when you turn your heart to God, times of refreshing come again. Your bad choices, our bad choices, they only lead. They'll lead, they'll lead to crisis, I'm telling you. And they only hurt you. They'll hurt the people that are closest to you, the people that you love the most even. But God's will, when you turn to it and you pursue it, times of refreshing will come again in your life. You see, Jonah, in the belly of that fish, turned his heart toward Nineveh. Um, The Bible says that God caused this great fish to spit him up onto dry ground. You can imagine Jonah smelling like fish guts. Anyone ever went fishing before a fish gut? This is stanky, smelly, Jonah all jacked up, man. He's on dry ground now. And he says this in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah... A second time. Now, what do you think God says a second time? Do you think he says, all right, that didn't work out. I got something better for you, Jonah. Maybe you'll like this option, Jonah. Hey, try, try this. No, don't expect a new word from, from God if you haven't obeyed the now word from God. Okay? And I think a lot of times we want to just sweep it under the, under the carpet and go, okay, give, give me a new job. Okay, how about a new church? How about a new friend? How about a new, how about a new wife? How about a new spouse? And God's, when you come back to that place, God's going to say, okay, go back to where you made that mistake and make it right. Go back to where I called you. Go do what I told you to do. Because he comes to Jonah a second time. And he says the same thing. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to, the, the, to it the message I told you to preach. So Jonah, I love this, arose and went to Nineveh. I, I, I picture Jonah in fish guts and just jacked up and in the belly of a well. And there's this, this rising up that has to happen for him to accomplish the will of God. You see, it's, it'd be so easy for him in that, in that stinky place to get down on himself, to doubt, on him, uh, to doubt his ability as to go be able to preach to someone now after I've disobeyed for so long. But if you want to recover from some of those bad choices, that are maybe even still haunting you today, you got to do this number three. You have to embrace God's grace. You have to embrace God's grace. We serve the God of second chances. I'm telling you, you can't go far enough. You can't, you can't disobey long enough. You can't do anything bad enough that God won't want you back. We serve the God of second chances. And I think sometimes we underestimate the power of grace. That grace is actually the fuel. It empowers you to rise up and accomplish the will of God. Look what Hebrews chapter 4, 16 says. Let us then with confidence draw near. You know, you don't, that, that confidence does not come from yourself. That confidence comes from the grace of God that because of his grace, I can do what God has called me to do. I can accomplish great things because of God's grace. It says that with confidence we draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So let me give you just a few pointers in this, in this idea of embracing God's grace because I know it's difficult for many people. Write this down. Number one, don't let those bad choices define you. Don't let those bad choices define you. You see, sometimes we let those mistakes and those mess-ups, and sometimes it's even the mess-ups of other people. Maybe it's their mistakes, and, and they, drug, they dragged us into their storm, and we're now, don't let that define you. Don't define your self-worth based on your mistakes or your mess-ups. You define your self-worth under the grace of God. That's who you are. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, God doesn't see us for our failures and for our mistakes, for our bad choices. He sees us redeemed. 
by His amazing grace. Now, and this is tough. It's, it's the, one of the toughest things for a lot of people is to, is to forgive ourselves. Is to just forgive ourselves. But listen, you'll never be what you're capable of becoming until you understand who you are right now. You are redeemed. You are loved by God. You are a child of God. And you are immeasurably loved. You need to know that. And you'll never measure up to God's, to your destiny until you know who you are in Christ. Some of you made some bad choices. So what? <laughs> who hasn't? We've all made some bad choices, you guys. All right? So who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe you? Like, what are you feeling? Are you going to believe what your past, what your history says, and you're reading your history? Are you going to believe what others have told you? Or are you going to believe what God says about you? Because the voice you believe will determine the future you have. And you can recover. I'm telling you, you can recover. I don't care what it is today. You can recover. Because we serve that God of second chances. Don't let your bad choices define you. And secondly, don't let your bad choices disqualify you. Don't let your bad choices disqualify you. I can see jo Jonah all in fish cuts again. He could just be beating himself up, hearing the voice of God, go and preach that word. And, oh, there's no way I can do that. Oh, I'm, I'm just, I've disobeyed you. I've, I'm not qualified to do that. I've, I've ran away too much. I've, I've done too much. I can't lead a small group, God. I can't serve you in ministry. I can't do that outreach. I can't make a difference, God. I've just gone too far away and I can hear Jonah and all of us in this story kind of pushing back on God. But God is not looking at your disobedience. He's looking at your destiny. When God sees you, aren't you thankful, man, that how God sees you, He does not see you for your mess-ups and for your failures. He doesn't see you for your disobedience. He sees that completed product. He sees you for your destiny. Amen, church? See, you might run away from God, but God will never abandon you. You might run away from his will and try to get as much distance as you can between you and God. And some of you taking so many detours away from the will of God. But I'm telling you, God will stand there at the ready, at the point of your crisis to rescue you again. If you just turn your heart to him. Romans 8, 28 says that we know in all things. Yeah, that's your, that's your bad choice. That's your mess up. That's that, that, that. Yes, that's it. He can make those things work for the good. He says, if you just love me, if you just love me, if you just let me call you according to my purpose, if that's the way you live, called according to my purpose, all those mistakes and bad choices you made, I'll fit it into the plan. I'll make it even for your good. So Jonah, I believe Jonah, before he would go, um, he'd want to kind of help us safeguard ourselves from, some, from bad choices, to put in some safeguards from the bad choices kind of happening again. So write down a few things I think Jonah just would say in leaving us. Number one, I think he'd say, you have to use God's word to guide you. You want to safeguard yourself from some bad choices? God's word will guide you to God's best for you. The safest place that you can be is in the center of God's will. And God's word will guide you into God's will for your life. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my path. You see, you can use it in everyday life. It, the word of God, it illuminates your path that you can take the next step. To, should, should I take that promotion? Should I, should I make that decision? The word of God will light your path. James says it this way in verse 22 of chapter 1. He says, don't just merely listen to the word. Don't just go, oh, that's good preaching. Oh, that's a good sermon. Oh, that's a, that's a good word. No, don't do that and just deceive yourself. He says, do what it says. Use the word of God to guide you. Um, one of the greatest ways that I practice on using the word of God to guide my life is when I come to decisions and I need to make a decision, I find a verse or verse is for it. I let the word of God light that up. Listen, don't make, don't make decisions without seeking the counsel of the word of God. It's going to light up the right decision for you. Okay? Go, so if it's something with our kids, Veronica and I are dealing something with our kids, we go find a verse for it. If it's something for our church or with my staff here, so I'll go find a verse. Share a verse. Let it light up our path. And study the word. Do what it says. Study it. Don't just... 
Don't just flip to, I know some people that just flip open the Bible, you know, and just read what is there, whatever is there. Don't do that, man. That's not a good way. That's not a healthy diet to get in the Word of God. Don't just flip to it. There's one guy who kind of just kind of flipped to it, and he flipped out, and he's like, what does God have for me today? And he turned to Matthew 12, or 27, 7, and it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. And so he's like, well, I don't like that. That's not good. Let me go. Let me get another one. And he, Luke 10, 37, and it says, go and do likewise. So he said, let me go again. He, John 13, 27. And Jesus said, go do it quickly. So it's just not a good idea, okay, to flip open the Bible and just try to get a word. Study the word of God. I'm telling you, the word of God is likened to a seed. Actually, if you go read James 1, it says it's the word of truth, that it bears fruit in your life, that this, God says the word of God has the power to change your life. Think about that area of your life. You feel even powerless to change. That area that just like, like it's, it's hard, it's difficult. God says, I can change that by the power of my word. That can change. Use God's word to guide you. Here's the second thing I think he'd say to safeguard us from some bad decisions. He'd say, ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom before you, I, I kind of want you to write in before you make the decision, all right? Because I think some of us are in this, in a place where, um, you know, we, we find ourselves in, like, we're not in direct disobedience, but we're in, like, willful disobedience to God, like, purposefully going, like, forget you, God, I heard what you said, I'm going this way. Some of us may that be, but I think more, many more of us, we are in, in like a, not a willful disobedience. We just didn't, we just didn't pause and go, God, what do you have for my life? For wisdom, it's actually one of his jobs. John 16, 13 says, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He's the, he is our guide to walking in truth. So let me give you three questions that you can ask yourself whenever you come to a place, a crossroads, where you need to make a decision, whether how small or big, you can ask yourself these three questions here. Write them down. Number one, ask, are my choices God honoring? Are my choices God honoring, because I want everything, everything to honor God. I want my relationships to honor God. I want my finances to honor God. I want my business, my career to honor God. Everything I want to honor God. And if you ask that question with sincerity, I promise you the Holy Spirit will, will answer you. And if you and if you feel that check in your spirit where there's no peace, there is no need to ask any more questions. You just need to stop right there. Right. Because if it doesn't honor God, I don't need to move forward. You don't need to throw out a fleece and go, okay, God, okay. But I'll, I'll try this job then for six months, God. And if it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll move over there just for a little bit then, God. If it doesn't work out, no. If it doesn't honor God, then you don't do it. But if, if in your spirit you say, you know what? This, this is something that I feel honors God. You move to step number two, that question you can ask is, how will this affect my spiritual health? How will this affect my spiritual health. Is it going to bring me closer to God? Or is it going to drive me further away? Is, is this relationship going to bring me closer to God? I think we have so many relationships that are dragging us toward Tarshish instead of urging us on towards Nineveh and the will of God. And, I think, and a lot of us, I just think we, that we are not aware of the power that the, the relationships have in our decision-making process. Like the decisions that we're making, how big that those relationships that we have are influencing our decisions. And, and I think if you're a Christian today, if you're a child of God, you're a servant of God today. Can I just speak to you just very directly? You, you have, someone told me this a long time ago. I think it was a good advice. You need to separate your friends into two categories. There, there are two types of friends. There are friends that you're on mission for. And there's friends you're on mission with. That'll save you a lot of a lot of headache and trouble if you if you just know who they are, who the fr the friends you're on mission for are the friends that you know that you're you're in their life to help shine a light and be salt to lead them to Christ to help fulfill their destiny their purpose that you're there to encourage them and and you're on mission for them. There are friends you're on mission with that you're doing the will of God together. You're encouraging each other in the will of God. You're promoting e each other as well. Listen, if you are a child of God then you are on mission. And there is no other category of friends except for the ones you're on mission for and the ones you're on mission with. There is no other relationships that exist in your life, child of God, man of God, woman of God, than those you're on mission for and those you're on mission with. 
You see, where we get tripped up sometimes is we have this, this little hidden category of friends. Ah, oh, that's, that's just my crew, my friends. Those are just some people. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you have no idea how much they are influencing your life and the decisions you're making. Who are you on mission for? And who are you on mission with? How will this decision affect my spiritual health? Is it drawing me towards God? Or is it going to pull me away from God and the will of God, what I know He's called me to do? And then lastly here, how will this decision affect the people closest to me? How will this, because every, every decision has impact. And hey, you might be ready for it, but maybe she's not. Maybe he's not. Maybe your kids aren't. Sometimes the right thing for you isn't the right thing for the people around you. And just because something's not wrong doesn't make it right. Amen, somebody? Just because something's not wrong doesn't, doesn't make it right. How will this affect the people closest to me? Jonah, he, he, he caused a storm and a crisis for all these people in this, in this ship. I was reading this article. It's a, a 2004 paper. Uh, let me get this right. Paper on the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. It talked about the actions that we, that we make and how much they influence the people that we're around. All the way as, as early as 18 months old infants are influenced by the actions of the people around them. How is this going to affect the people that I'm, in, I'm on mission for and the people that I'm on mission with? How is it going to affect the people who are closest to me? Here's the last thing I think Jonah would say to safeguard us from some bad decisions. I think he'd say, hey, man, you got to get into your word of God. Get a healthy devotion life. Seek the Holy Spirit for wisdom. He'll guide you into truth. Do it. And then thirdly, I think he'd say to seek godly counsel. This is something Jonah lacked. He didn't have this in, in his life. People who are mature, men and women of character, who are seasoned and experienced in faith, they're gonna, they will help you kind of di- discern the will of God. Proverbs 13 and 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. You need to, you, the, the Bible says, another proverb says that, in the multitude of counselors, plans succeed. That plans actually fail for lack of counsel. You need some people in your life. You need a community of people. Some friends that are close enough to counsel you and advise you and to warn you of some some blind spots. And if you're not in a group, man, you need to get in a small group. No matter where you're at today, no matter what choice you find yourself in today or how far you think you're away from God, you're actually not. God's right there. He's right here. And he's ready to rescue you if you just change your direction. Come on, let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer today.